So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Don Spafford. Don has been investing since 2017. He purchased his first fourplex using creative financing methods and worked his way into commercial real estate. He started a personal finance blog to help others searching for financial independence. Now he is syndicating large ground-up development and value-add RV campgrounds. Don, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Love it. Uh, love the name, Happy Camper Capital. That's great. Um, looking forward to hearing the story of that, but let's kind of take it back to the beginning. Uh, we kind of mentioned you started in 2017, but take mm -hmm. us back a little bit before that, what you were doing and you know how you discovered uh, real estate. So, man, going back, I guess, so my my educational background is in finance, investment science, portfolio management. So my career path was set towards going towards that, you know, financial advisor type role. Um, so by the time I finished school, though, I, I was going part time because I was raising a family and everything going on. So I finished my education that in 2008. <laughs> like, so spring 2008, I, I got my degree. Like, yeah, I'm gonna go get a job. And I, mean, I, of course, I was already working in that industry anyway, but I wanted to like, you know, go, go to that next step and, and, and move up. Um, but, you know, around that point, of course, is where the, the financial crisis was beginning and all these finance related positions were being laid off and, and going out of business. And so I was like, okay, that's maybe I'll have to hold off for a bit. And so I, I kind of stayed where I was at in the time of my job. And uh, not long after that, my um, as our, our youngest child at that time was starting school, my wife had always been a stay-at-home mom and she uh, wanted something to do. We wanted her to go out and, and work, but at uh, the same time, be, be available when the kids are sick or during summer and whatnot. So um, it just so happened that, you know, for whatever reason, I was already kind of looking into real estate because of that, that 2008, nine crash. I saw these house prices come down. I was like, man, it'd be great to be able to buy one of these houses and, and hold on to it. But I had no idea how or, or how, you know, how that's done. But um, anyway, so, so because it, I guess it had been in my mind, I'd mentioned to her, what about being a realtor? You know, um, you know, you get some good income and be flexible. And, you know, she, she looked into it and she liked the idea. She likes talking to people and helping people. So she became a realtor around 2010. Um, and that's kind of really where we began, I'd say, because she, she began working with investors right from the very beginning. You know, some of her very first clients were investors buying properties in, in, in cash at that point and, and doing a burst strategy. Um, which I had no clue what, how they were doing that at the time. It just was like blowing my mind. I was like, wow, that's awesome. You could do that. And uh, uh, so I was like, man, I, I wish I could do this. Like, you know, I had no, had no idea how, didn't have any really even funds to do that set aside to, to, for investing at that level, at least so I thought. Um, and uh, so that's kind of really the, the beginning, I'd say, of, of that. I started reading some books. Um, you know, the very first investment related, you know, real estate investment related book I read was uh, Gary Keller's uh, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Um, it's kind of where I started getting the, the thoughts going. I was like, okay, this is how you do it. Um, but uh, and that, and at that point, we lived, we lived in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and then we made the decision around 2013, 14, somewhere there, that we need, needed to move to Idaho. So I kind of put all that on hold. I didn't want to get our first property and then like leave it long distance, not knowing how that's done. And um, that just felt too scary. So I was like, okay, well, let's wait. Uh, put, on, put all that on hold, got our house ready to sell, which of course now looking back, I wish we could just kept that house <laughs> and just rented it, but sold the house, moved here to Idaho where we're at now. Um, and then about maybe a year later, kind of got back into it, you know, looking around again, trying to figure it out. And um, I ended up going to a, a uh, you know, one of those guru type seminars coming through town, uh, mainly geared towards house flipping uh, with their expensive program. Uh, which I was like, okay, this sounds awesome. But I was like, I don't follow. It's not a huge market. I don't, I don't know if the, the price for your coaching is worth what I'm going to be able to do here in Idaho Falls. Um, of course, the, you know, the, the principles and concepts could be put elsewhere, but long distance, but still, you know, without having all that stuff in place, I was like, that, that's a lot of money to, to risk. Um, so I said, like, no, thank you. But uh, I met a guy there that uh, mentioned to me, biggerpockets.com. And I was like, what's that? You know, I'd never heard of it before. And 
got on there and, and, you know, fell in love. I said, love at first sight. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. You know, I played the calculators and everything. So this was like my, my starting point really was there. Like the end of 2016 um, was when I got in there and then, then uh, started listening to the podcast every day and, um, you know, made the decision in, in early 2017. It's like, I got it. We've got to find a property. We're, we're going to make this happen. And I knew I wanted to go multifamily. Uh, I wanted to skip the single family stuff. I saw that was too risky for, for, for my taste. Um, and so I set out to, to buy a fourplex was my, my, my goal. Um, and, uh, we, we found one actually listed on, on Craigslist, uh, in, in, in March of 2017, uh, and we end up, end up getting that one. We, we used some creative financing and closed on that in, in June of 2017 was our very first property and it's fourplex. Wow. That's awesome. Quite the story there. Um, can definitely relate in terms of, you know, like wanting to kind of know as much as possible before you get into it. And then, you know, you kind of get into it and realize there's just so much more you don't know. So you may as well just get involved. But, yeah. um, you know, how, how did that lead to commercial real estate? Was it scaling or what was it where you're like, no, I actually want to jump over here to, to commercial? Yeah, so it was sort of unintentional, but at the same time, I, I knew that's where I wanted to go. Um, I, I, I was, of course, listening to these podcasts all the time. I hear people talk about, you know, essentially doing the burst strategy, but on apartment buildings, I'm like, man, that'd be awesome. Um, you know, but, uh, again, not knowing how, or, or even having any connections to people that were doing it. Um, uh, what came up for me to get into commercial was kind of more knowing that I wanted to do that. But, um, so I, I, I just put myself on these, you know, investor lists. Essentially I, I started talking to, uh, brokers and, um, wholesalers just to, to get on their list and start getting things sent to me all the time. Um, I did speak with a couple of people doing syndications early on. Um, you know, the, the only ones I'd really ever spoken to directly um, for me to come on. is like, you know, I was asking them questions like, how did you become a GP? How does that happen? You know, uh, they explained, you know, we started as an LP and I did so many deals and then, okay, how did I start as an LP? You know, and so I started to ask these questions just to see how did I even get started. And, you know, even for me at that point, though, that this, this person I was sp speaking with at the time, her, their, their minimum investment was 75,000. I was like, that's a lot. <laughs> I was like, I don't have that much money. And, and then even then I was like, that's a lot to risk trusting into somebody else that I really don't know. Um, so I wasn't ready for that. But uh, so I got on these lists and, um, you know, I, one day I had this, uh, there was a 22 unit property sent to me um, in, in more or less the middle of Arkansas, uh, outside of Little Rock. And it's like, yes, that looks pretty interesting. And the, 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 the price was pretty actually cheap, we'll say at the time, you know, for, for a 22 unit building. I, you know, I had not much to really compare it to. I didn't really quite yet understand fully the whole concept of, of commercial financing. Um, but uh, I, I at least wanted to look into it. I was like, okay, let me, let me see if I can get this. And this was a through wholesaler. So they're going to need cash to buy it. I think it was like, uh, I don't know. So it was less than 300,000. I think total, it was 250, something like that to, to buy it in cash, which I didn't have, but I was like, okay, I, I can maybe figure out how to do this happen. I, was, I started to have that mindset shift. Okay. Not, not saying that I can't, but you know, how can I, you know? So, um, so, so kind of by accident. So, so I called up the, the local bank there just to see um, if they have a seasoning period, if I were to buy this property, how long would I have to hold it before I can refinance it? And, um, you know, and, and it turned out this, this random bank I called up actually held the current note for that property. So they exactly knew, <laughs> they knew the property, they knew the owner, uh, everything about it. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. I don't know if that's some kind of a, a sign here, but, uh, you know, he put me in contact with his wife, who's a broker there. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to find a way to make that happen. Um, to actually kind of get around it and kind of go directly to the seller since they had that connection with, with the owner. <laughs> I was like, maybe we can just bypass the wholesaler. <laughs> you know, didn't really want to be shady like that, but, but it's like, if, you know, if I could find a way to make this happen with a bank loan, instead of trying to find cash, then, then why not, you know? Um, anyway, it ended up not working. Uh, and, uh, end up, it turned out I ended up buying two more fourplexes in that area <laughs> through that, through that broker because of it though. So, uh, and then kind of from there is where it, it got shifted into the commercial kind of again sort of by accident um the so this broker that we just closed these fourplexes in and uh, say december of 2018 i guess it's been um she called me up in around march february march 2019 uh told me about this commercial lot that was that they had available it was off market thing um that was essentially like a gold mine, I guess, that from what they're telling me about this, this area that's just exploding, about to have huge development stuff going on. Um, and I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. So I was like, 
well, let's get in, let's, let's get into contract and uh, I'll see what I can do. You know, um, you know, this is something I need to close in like, you know, less than a month uh, for, for like basically half a million dollars. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I was like, I'm on the, I'm on the try. I, I don't have the cash. And as long as they don't need an earnest deposit, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. You know, it's worth trying. So, so we got into contract and I just got to work just contacting people that I'd met through bigger pockets, you know, saying, Hey, there's kind of explain to them what's going on and why it's, why this is actually valuable. Cause to, to me, when they explained to me, it totally made sense. I was like, okay, I see there's a huge value here. Um, and so, uh, you know, calling, calling several people, emailing all these people I'd met through at that point, bigger pockets was my only true social media. I was not active on LinkedIn or Facebook or anything. Um, and so, uh, I, it turned out I connected with a guy again, back, going back to those, those lists I was getting on through wholesalers list and stuff, uh, a guy that's in that area that does house flips and, and wholesales properties as well. Uh, I got, I just happened to get a random email from him just being on that list. I totally forgot about it. And I was like, so I saw this email one day. I was like, oh yeah, he's, he's in that area, you know? Uh, so I was like, hey, called him up. I was like, hey, do you, you're familiar with this area? You know what's going on here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I totally know what you're talking about. Uh, and so he had his connections to his his uh, private investors that he'd used. So we got the deal under contract, him and I together as a JV deal. He brought his his investor capital. We were able to buy this commercial lot. Um, and now, now it's technically not, we'll say commercial, like the way people are thinking, but that was my first commercial property being this commercial land. Uh, it was already zoned commercial and we were going to flip it. Uh, and that's what led to then everything else. So not long after I, I asked that, that, uh, other agent there with the, the lat, I was like, is there any more of those lots available? Um, and he said, yeah, there's this other one down the road, a uh, smaller one. So I was like, okay. You know, and so we, I looked into that one as I wanted to, to just not just flip this land. I wanted to build on it. Cause he told me there's this need for, for, well, actually I, I was initially planning on building some like townhomes or fourplexes or something on there. But he said there's a huge demand and need for for commercial space, like you know, uh, retail stores. Uh, so I was like, hmm, okay, that's something to look into. Uh, did not even consider it before, but uh, you know, I'd I'd heard several people talking about you know triple net leases and, and the benefits of all that, and so I looked into it, ran some quick analysis of, of the costs and and the expected rents, and the the commercial properties made much more sense as far as like the, the overall returns and, and um, the capital needed up front. So I was like, so kind of the same thing again. I was like, okay, let's get into contract. And then I went and found a partner. I <laughs> uh, found a guy that, that was willing to bring some, some cash. That, that, you know, he liked the idea as well. Um, so we got that under contract uh, and then uh, immediately got to work making plans to, to build something there. Um, and we're now still almost a year later and it's still in process of that. It's a long process to get to that point, but uh, we're, we're hopefully finding about to, to break ground on that. Um, and so that was now my, my first now technical, technically, I guess, speaking commercial property about to be built. But then that led to some other things come up that uh, just uh, during this point, I was trying to get more into like the full on multifamily commercial stuff, you know, and, and either come on as an LP at the minimum or, or preferably find a property that I could now connect with some other people that are doing syndications like, hey, I've got this property under contract, you know, that let's, I'll, I'll lead on you to help me do it. I'll, give me a small piece and let's, let's make this happen. Um, but I was not finding anything that for me made sense you know, as far as like the, the kind of returns I was expecting to, to see. Um, you know, based on the, the previous properties I'd bought, my, my fourplexes were doing excellent. They had very high returns. So I was like, I don't, I don't want to accept something much less than that. You know, it just didn't make sense. I was like, I might as well keep buying fourplexes on a smaller scale and getting huge returns than buy up something big and get a small return. Um, even though, of course, the, the amounts make, make up the difference. But but still, I, I look at the actual return numbers, like not not the dollar amount, but the actual percentage. And so um, anyway, because of previous connections I'd made with, with people, I, I end up getting... Um, involved with a, a team here locally that does some ground up development. They had done several projects around town, building some, some new town home communities. Um, and so they had approached me actually about investing one of their deals. And which at this time actually made sense. The, the, the returns they were offering were pretty great. I was like, wow, that's pretty good compared to what I've been seeing everywhere else. And so uh, I just mentioned to them, I was like, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm now going to these meetup events. I'm ne network with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, commercial investors and syndicators, people that are looking for deals and, and um, to have money to invest in deals. I was like, how about we work together? You know, if you guys are willing to let me come on as part of your team, I could bring in these connections I have with, with investors to, to uh, help fund your deals. Um, and so they, <laughs> luckily for me, they, they, they agreed that they liked me enough that uh, they, they felt, okay, I, I could probably bring some value to that. Um, and so, uh, so we got together, made that happen. And then the, the very next deal that came up with, with them, was a, a huge ground up development of uh, about 800 total units of a multifamily here in Idaho Falls, Idaho. 
Uh, and so I was just like, wow, that, that just kind of blew me away. <clears throat> I was not expecting something that big <laughs> to come up right away. Seriously. But uh, yeah, so I was like, wow, this, this is awesome. So so I came and I got involved with that. Um, you know, so so I, I I provided more benefit than, than I initially thought I would because I was like, okay, I'm just going to come here basically trying to raise capital is my, my main role. Uh, but these guys, being they're, they're full-on developers, they've really never did like a full-on, we'll say, syndication. They, they, they raised capital, but mainly through family and friends. So they didn't have to go, go outside of that. So they didn't have to do too much explanation of what they're doing <laughs> or, or having much of uh, documentation about anything. It's, hey, we're building this, you know, invest. And so they get the money thrown at them. Um, so I come on and I'm, I talk to my investors like, well, you know, what's, what's the plan? What's the, you know, let me see documentation. What's the, who, who, who's the GP team and stuff. So we didn't have any of that. So I was like, okay, let me, let me put something together. So I, I came on as at that point, almost more like the, you know, I guess we'll say I'm a marketing person or something. So I put together some documentations of, of, um, you know, here's the project we're doing. Here's the returns. Here's why I don't follow makes sense. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff that people want to see. Uh, so we have something to, to provide. Um, and so for me, that, that was also my, my first attempt at capital raising. Um, you know, I'd never done before on, on anything really other than these JV deals, which, you know, I don't really count those capital raising as found partners. But uh, so for me, it was a difficult one because I didn't, really didn't have the, 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 even though I had people that invest, I didn't have like the full on relationship and connections from the, to trust investing with me at that point. And on top of that, it was a ground up development. You know, it was many people saw it as something risky. It's not the existing cash flowing property. Um, you know, especially at this point, this is, you know, early on in, in the COVID and, and uh, prices were, were going up for materials and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it, many people saw it as, as risky, but uh, you know, it still in the end worked out, you know, we, we did well. Um, uh, you know, now we're planning another project uh, down the road here in, in another state. Um, but, uh, with that, again, I, even with, with that going on, I was still trying to find some other multifamily deals that I could do on my own or, or partner with in some way or other. Um, and, and that's what kind of led me in, in got involved with happy camper capital. Um, not at all what I was looking to do. Again, I was trying to find multifamily something, um, or possibly even some self storage, mobile home parks, something, you know, the, the known things, I guess, that people know of, of commercial real estate. Um, and, uh, you know, one day I heard on a podcast, somebody talking about campgrounds is like really that's that's the thing you can invest in you know um and uh i was like that sounds interesting though i I was like you know i never considered it and and being where i'm at in in in, uh, eastern idaho close to like yellowstone we've got a lot of it's a very big camping area people here have campers and rvs and go out all the time um so i started talking to my neighbors i i talked to some of my neighbors before about investing in multifamily and it was something that they were too scared of that they weren't familiar with um you know it, it didn't make sense to them but I talked to them about campgrounds and like, oh, that, that, would, that would be pretty cool. We, we'd like to invest in something like that, you know, cause this is now something that they use and, and they're familiar with. And so uh, I was like, okay, there could be something here. So, so I, yeah, I looked more into it and uh, ended up connecting with a couple of guys that uh, based in, in Colorado, uh, Adam Lindy and, and Justin Hoggett. Um, they had uh, started or formed to say happy camper capital in, in 2020 um, had just closed on their first deal uh, in 2021. And uh you know, they were looking to expand. They, they'd done all this on their own, just two guys. Uh, they wanted to grow their team and, and do more deals. And um, as I, we, we met and talked together and talked about my goals and their goals. And then of course, on top of that, the, the returns they were getting for these properties. I was like, man, this is, this is insane. I was like, I, I, you know, at first I was like, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still, you know, I'm still trying to find multifamily stuff. And, and, and I'm in these masterminds that are all about the multifamily. And, um, you know, I might be kicked out or, or, or laughed at or something, but <laughs> But uh, I was like, you know what? The more I thought about it and looked into it, I was like, I was like, I would be crazy to pass up this opportunity. You know, if, if you know, five years from now, I don't want to look back and say, man, why didn't I take that chance when I had the opportunity? So, so, uh, so I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's just do it. So I officially joined up with them in, in uh, November of last year in 2021, and uh, it's been going all in ever since. And uh, you know, I've been going to meetups, talking about campgrounds. And the, 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 the fun thing is, you know, for, for me, actually, you know, when I get to talk to people, to investors that are looking and to, to want to know more, you know, I actually enjoy telling them about it because it's, it's a brand new thing that most people are not, well, it's not say it's brand new, but it's unknown to too many people that uh, as something that you can invest in, like, just like myself was, you know, not too long ago. And so it's, so it's uh, exciting to, to tell people about it and what we're doing and, and the kind of returns that they can get. And, and what I like most about it is, is that, you know, as an investor, you know, you have the opportunity to, to actually go to these places with your family and friends and, and go there and have fun and hang out and, and create 
you know, memories, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've never outside of the, the fourplex I have here, you know, I've taken my kids to help me clean out one of the units once in a while. That's about the only kind of memories they're going to have, you know, not really pleasant ones that they would care to remember. Ah, we used to clean apartments, you know, but, uh, you know, now we say, Hey, let's go to these campgrounds and go, just go have fun. You know, and that's going to be a, a lasting, you know, family, good memory that you can have. And, and at the same time, talk about, you know, you're invested in this property, you know, we're, we're here having fun, but you're also making money on it. Um, so, so it's a very unique experience as an investor for that. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's an awesome story. What, uh, uh, I love that you have kind of done a little bit of everything. Um, that first piece of land, did you end up just kind of, was it just like land entitlement and then you flipped it or. So it was already, it was already zoned commercial. Uh, we had bought it early on. So again, we, we bought it in 2019, planned to sell it in 2020. Uh, with, of course, COVID happening, we decided not to do that because, you know, there's nothing going on. Um, so we held on to it for another year. And then uh, the, the plan was to, to, to sell it at that point. Um, the, again, there was a lot of development going on, but but it was all now at this point behind schedule, uh, again, because of COVID stuff. So right next to this property, there's a, a large assisted living facility that was supposed to be built. It's now getting started, but it's just barely getting like the, the footings and stuff in place. So it's, it's far behind where it should have been at this point. Um, and, and that's a big, I guess, for us, sort of a problem because if, if it had been done earlier, our lot would have easily sold. Um, we've got several invested or interested, uh, say like doctors or, or people who want to put a medical office there, of course, right next door to, to a assisted living, but they want that to be done first, uh, you know, to, to not be there and not have any patients that they can right. you know, take. Yeah, so, makes sense. Um, so, so we're, we're still kind of waiting. We've got several, again, several interested parties in, in it. Um, we're actually now at this point considering just building on something ourselves. So, um, so we'll see, we're, we're kind of at that point where we're waiting to see, uh, we're, we're going to kind of push more on the people that are interested let them know, Hey, if you want this, make an offer now, otherwise you might not get a chance to, cause we're going to build on ourselves. Totally. Um, and, and so, so that was, but that was the, the initial plan from the very beginning was just to, to buy it and, and resell it a year later, um, flip it just for, for essentially triple what we bought it for. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so we're still kind of in that phase now where it's like, we still may, or we may just go ahead and just build on ourselves and go that route. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. I just want to touch on that. Cause I did a land entitlement deal. Uh, that actually ended up taking about a year. We weren't anticipating that. Um, so huge, huge fan of it. You know, if you do a ride, it's a nice way to kind of supplement. And even some people, you know, do it full time. But um, yeah, um, let's come back to Happy Camper. I love that name, first of all, uh, especially obviously you're in that asset class. I actually yeah. just had Dylan Marma on the podcast, if you know who he is Yeah. Um, with Requity Group. And they do the same thing. And we kind of, you know, touched on it. Uh, and turns out there are people who own these campgrounds, right? They're an asset class, mm -hmm. um, certainly a unique one. So kind of touch on it, you know, what, you know, kind of goes into it, what, what makes it unique. And, and I know that the management, it can be tricky. So, so kind of touch on that as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I guess the, the biggest question I get from people is like, you know, what, what do you do to, to value add? You, know, you, you think of these are, you know, I get people that think we're either doing ground up development or these are more like just a turnkey operation kind of thing. Uh, which they, they can be, but we're, we, uh, on our team, anyway, for Happy Camper Capital, we're doing more of the value add, you know, so we're finding a lot of these properties that are, are, we'll say, you know, mom and pop owned, right? They've been family owned and operated for possibly decades. Um, so therefore there's, they're, in most cases have not done much to, to modernize them. Um, they're just kind of keep it simple, you know, phone call reservations and, and same price every day of the week, any time of day. Um, and so they've never really been able to expand because again, they're, they themselves are doing the job of probably six people. So they can't take on much more anyway. So they're, they're trying to control their, their costs and, and, you know, make it feel like it's their baby and their thing. So they don't really, you know, make, make it the most out that they could. So, so we can come in there. We, we have our own internal or say external management company. It's a separate entity called Beyonder Camp that does campground management. <clears throat> so we have the software um, and, and everything we need to, in place to, to totally ramp up their, their online presence through, through the website and through online reservations, um, which, you know, that alone is going to just increase the, the amount of people that come there. If they can find you online and, and make a reservation online, that, that right there is going to increase your revenue by at least 5%, um, you know, as opposed to somebody that doesn't want to pick up a phone, you know, so, uh, so that's one thing. But uh, so overall, I mean, the, the, the general, we'll, we'll say I, I, ideas, very similar to those that are familiar with the multifamily value add, you know, we're still going in and finding ways to improve it. Uh, we're just not necessarily replacing flooring and, and appliances and, and 
you know, all those things to, to increase the rents. Uh, it's more of providing amenities and, and uh, the things that people want to come there and do. There's not necessarily a lot we do on the, the ground side itself, you know, other than maybe possibly upgrading the, the electrical connections. Um, a lot of these places, <clears throat> the, the, like we say, especially the older ones are, are kind of like an older, you know, 30 amp connection. Um, newer ones are like your 50s, the current uh, standard. Uh, we're on many cases upgrading all the way up to 100 uh, just to have them be ready for, you know, the EV vehicles that are coming through. Um, you know, the safe stuff, so you, you've got an electric truck or even an electric RV that you're looking to go somewhere. It's like, hey, we, we can we can take you here and, and charge. So um, that's one thing we're upgrading on. But, uh, you know, in most cases, we, we try to find ones that have room to expand. So if, if say it's a 100, 150 campground site, it was like, hey, we can build out to 200, 250 or more, then, then let's do that. Of course, if it makes sense to do. Um, we're very, I say, picky and conservative on, on where we're buying and, and what we're buying. You know, of course, like, it's like almost like I guess anything. We, we review probably you know, 100 properties before we find, you know, a couple that are even worth putting an LOI on. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so there's there's you know multiple things that we can do. Um, th what I like about this a lot is that, as compared to multifamily, for example, <clears throat> there's only so much value add you can do, right? Um, the the market rent is say a thousand dollars a month. You you totally push it as much as you can. You make these like super, look super nice, almost like brand new. Uh, you can even gold plate the toilet. You know maybe you're gonna get your push the rent up to eleven hundred a month. Yeah, that that market thousand rent so but that's about as much you can do you can't really go much past your actual market rent what it's going to allow uh no matter what how much you, you spend and do whereas on the campgrounds it's almost we'll say unlimited upside you know you, there's whatever you can think to do and, and some way to add on additional features additional values additional amenities you can add on additional revenue streams constantly <clears throat> so it could be in cases if, if there's not one existing you could add on like a convenience store um if there's some kind of water feature like a river lake pond whatever uh, put in some like paddleboard rentals or boat rentals or, or uh, have, you know, of course, a bait shop there and things. Um, potentially, we, if, if depending where it's at, if it makes sense, uh, do some like weekend concerts or something to, to bring in crowds that people aren't there just for camping. They come out for, for other events that are going on. Uh, many of our, our campgrounds will have, uh, you know, a glamping type experience, you know, so people that are not just have uh, campers RVs, but they come just to you know, have fun, get some pictures. So we'll have some like short-term rental Airbnb style cabins or, or um, you know, other uh, campers or something on, on site that, that people can just come in and, and rent and stay there without having a, a camper or something of their own. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's just, there's, there's, you know, it, without going in too much into it, but there's, there's just multiple things you can do with that uh, makes it kind of fun because, you know, you can get creative on some of these things, um, you know, for, for, for some that are, like say a seasonal campsite where maybe uh, you know during winter most people aren't actually staying there and using it for much. You might still have some some cabins and things that you could rent for for short term rental, but in general the majority of the, the campsites are probably not being used if it's covered in snow. Um, but uh, you can do things like you know drive through uh, Christmas light decorations, you know, so uh, you know convert it into something like that. You know, rent rent the space out to a local business that that does that kind of thing and, and sharing the profits with them. Uh, you know, so so it's almost kind of like again, the, the, the sky's the limit of whatever you can think of, and uh, so if that of course makes sense and is legal to do, then uh, yeah, you can you can find a way to to generate more revenue for it. Awesome, I love that. Yeah, it is a very unique asset class in that sense that you know you there's so much you can do, even as basic as you know putting gravel or concrete on a pad, you know, and just making it a <laughs> a nicer space instead of just dirt. You know what I mean? Like right, yeah, yeah. You can add a uh, petting zoo, you know. Like all kinds of crazy stuff, um, for sure, which, which is great. And and like you mentioned, you know, it gives a lot of opportunity to to increase revenue. So in terms of location, you kind of mentioned snow and that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess sort of one uh, downside is that you know, depending on where it is, it may not be rented during certain seasons. So, are you guys um, diversifying your location so that something's always, you know, in operation? Yeah. So we we. Our plan is we're not restricted to say a certain region or, or state or you know whatever. I know some people that are in this space that say they're only buying like the southeast or you know Midwest or whatever. Um, we, we look across the country. Um, our our criteria is that it's got to be within a two or three hour drive of a, of a major growing population center. Um, so that way, no matter what, we always have a built in user base. Uh, you know, people again, people have campers RVs. They're they're going to go out and use them no matter what's going on. Um, you know, you can't take a trip to Disney World or the gas prices are ten dollars a gallon. Doesn't matter. They'll, they'll still drive a couple hours to go out and, and go have fun. Um, so we want that close, close um, 
you know, user base for that reason. Um, yeah, yeah, we may have something in Florida, something in like say Montana or, or wherever. Um, so, so we're, we're, we're open to anywhere really, um, as long as it makes sense. And even the ones that are seasonal, for example, that are uh, closed down during winter, you know, they're still open say maybe eight, nine months of the year. So they're still creating revenue during that, that part of the year, which is usually still enough to, to cover for the entire year anyway. Uh, so, so you're able to still give back your, your investors, their, their returns, even if it's only during that, such an open open season but but again if you get creative you can still find things to do during that winter time to, to still bring in some revenue absolutely so kind of along the investor line what is it like in terms of you know educating investors on this asset class and you, you know are you finding that more investors are you know the the yield is is very much in your favor in terms of operation and and as an investor but not a lot of investors know that right it's asset class not a lot of more people are, are kind of jumping into it, but um, so kind of talk about educating investors and what that's like in terms of, you know, showing them this, this asset class. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's uh, like I said, it's not, it's not new, but it's more unknown. There's, you know, as far as, as far as like a, a syndication model, I mean, people have been buying them for, for ever. Um, right. but always been conjunct, you know, family owned kind of thing. But, uh, but as far as the syndication, there's not a lot of people doing it right now. You know, there's definitely more people doing it. Um, and so it's still fairly, you know, new for most people to even know that it's something you can invest in. So yeah, there's a lot of education up front to explain, you know, what we do, why we do it, um, and how, why or how we get the returns we say we can get. Um, so we're generally we're when we're compared to other multifamily syndications that are currently going on right now, that these ones I've seen most of them anyway, we're at least double, if not more, of the returns that they're projecting on their um, their deals. And so people are like, wow, how is that even possible? I'm like, well, if we Break it down to a simple level. You know, people that are kind of familiar with like a short-term rental, like the you know, the Airbnb single-family home as a short-term rental model is going to generally always produce more income than a long-term rental on a single-family. So we look at it in that type of perspective that you know these campground spaces are really it's a short-term rental on a multifamily scale. You know, all these spaces that people are just coming, staying, and, and going, and so they're constantly coming in and out and uh, and producing that that income for it. So it's. It's kind of a lot of education of people explaining, you know, that, that's how it works, you know, what we're doing. Um, and of course, a lot of people, of course, ask, oh, what, what are the downsides? What, what are the risks? What could go wrong? Because, uh, because you know, this is, again, when you're not familiar with something, you you you're, you you think about the, the the negative sides, like what's what's the worst that could happen, you know? Um, you, know you know, if you have a, a multifamily property, it's like, well, you know, the worst that could happen is, you know, there's, there's a pandemic <laughs> and there's an eviction moratorium, people who aren't paying, but you can't do anything about it. Uh, which was, of course, totally unexpected. <laughs> but uh, you know, for for our side, that you know, that type of risk we don't even have because we don't have leases. We don't have people, you know, that are they're, you know, contracted to, to be there. If they they prepay to come, and if they outstay their welcome, you know, it's pretty much easy phone call to call the police for somebody trespassing. You know, it's it's uh, we don't have to go through courts, and and uh, and again, we're not worried about those expenses of of replacing carpets and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so for most people, it's just kind of getting over, helping them get over the, the, the fears, the misconceptions, um, you know, explain them exactly what we're doing. Cause again, we're not, we're not looking at the, the like overnight stay campsites that are on the side of the highway. These are more like resorts that we're, we're purchasing and running. So, you know, we have the, these full on amenities, like possibly, uh, you know, water parks and, and swimming pools and, uh, you know, all these events that go on. It's, it's more of a, like, these are like a destination. Like if you, you, you're, you know, you go to Disney World or, or you go here, basically. <laughs> you know, so uh, these are the kind of places we're, we're going after. Uh, and so people, when people, you know, people that see that, and especially those that have been to these, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that are like, yeah, we just went and stayed at one, like, you know, last year or whatever, and we had a blast, you know. So they were like, I, I, they totally saw, you know, especially an investor, you know, you, when you go there, you, you can see firsthand, like, wow, these, these places make a lot of money, <laughs> you know. So, uh, it, you know, it, without having that firsthand experience, it's trying to, trying to portray that, that type of feeling to somebody without ever having them been there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, there's definitely a lot of education for sure. Just, uh, but, uh, but we can usually get past all those concerns and, and most people are, are willing to come on board. You know, it's, it's, uh, again, something different it, in, in most cases, it's just adding some diversification to your portfolio. It's like, if you got a lot of multifamily, great, but you know, maybe it's good to have at least something else outside of that in case there's another pandemic type situation or, or, um, something goes on, some some law regulation changes that um, you know, may restrict how much rent you can charge or whatever. So, um, you know, it, it's good to have some some other asset classes in there as well. Awesome, I love that. That's it, it's so true, and that's a um, 
great diversity play, like you mentioned. Uh, didn't realize you guys were in like the basically the class A of these, which, like you mentioned, are more like a resort. A lot of like motor coaches, you know, those big, huge RVs kind of going down there. Um, like you mentioned, that that vac it's a destination. Exactly. As yeah, opposed yeah. to, you know, just somewhere you pull off uh, when you're tired on a long road trip. So Yeah, for sure. And what, what's great about that, too, if you think about, like, you know, a lot, a lot of these, like I said, those motor coaches and, and things, those are super expensive. Most, most, cases, most cases, more expensive than, than most houses. Absolutely. So what's what's cool about that is for us, anyway, we, we kind of have a built-in investor base in the people that use our properties. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're going there to stay. It's like, hey, you know, you, you're, you love being here. Why not make some money on invest with us? You know, and so uh, you know, we have that built-in. A lot of these people are going to be credit investors themselves that that use those, and so uh, that's kind of a unique experience as well for us. Totally, yeah. Some of those motor coaches are well into the seven figures, so definitely a potential investor uh, for sure, which is great. Um, cool. Well, we're kind of coming up against time here. Um, appreciated all of the uh, insight again. Um, like you mentioned, not a new asset class, but um, just one, I guess, not as uh, as sexy as multifamily seems to be kind of the pinnacle, but um, definitely one I want to take a look at because these resort things are very intriguing. So uh, I love it. But I do have five questions to ask all of my guests. Uh, it's the final five. So first question, uh, what's the best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Um, from a mentor? That's kind of hard to say because I honestly never really had a mentor. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd say, you know, Early on, I think, um, man, I, I go back to even when I was probably 14. I had my first job when I was 14 uh, working at Dairy Queen. Um, the, the, the guy there was, you know, into like Amway and that kind of stuff, you know. So uh, I think he, he was one that early on kind of told me when those, it's a common saying, I guess, but uh, knew to me at the time, maybe it was, uh, um, you know, like more of a, you know, whatever money you make, um, live, live on your, as little as you can and then invest the rest. Um, you know, and don't know exact exact words how it's supposed to go, but but you know what I mean. Live live below your means and then and, and invest the rest. Um, awesome. to to uh to work out yourself out there. I love it. That's such great advice. So true. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Boy, um, definitely the 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 two aspects the the income and the the wealth generation. Um, uh, my my wife for me is is making sure my family's taken care of no matter what. So if I you know I don't expect to live forever. But uh, you know, if, if I should go sooner than, than I hope, you know, I want to let my family be taken care of no matter what. Uh, that, that my wife is not scrambling, like how are we going to make ends meet or whatever. So uh, some big part of my why is, is having that passive income to, to make sure that there's at least enough to take care of the family. And of course, that long-term wealth as well, that at some point down the road, um, you know, my kids may inherit whatever we, we own ourselves and then uh, they'll be taken care of hopefully for, for generations. Awesome. Love that. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Um, okay. No, yeah, that's hard one. Non, non-real estate, non-investment related. Yeah. Like uh, self-help is good. Business related. Um, you know, I don't really read much books outside of <laughs> investments in, in real estate. I've uh, never really been a book reader at all. I, I got into it after I got into real estate. So I read, read for all the books I read are either finance or, or real estate related. Um, it was a good so, finance book. So, so I'd, I'd go, the, one, one of my personal favorites, honestly, is uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, it's it's a, nice. kind of more of a mindset book, but very much you know, business finance related. No, that's uh, perfect. It, it, it totally blew me away when I out, out, out did my expectations for that book. It's definitely on my list because it's been mentioned by another guest as well. So I definitely got to check it out. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? <laughs> if I could have any. Um, boy, I, I'd say um, that's a hard one, I guess. <laughs> Maybe going back in time, but not too far back, like the last, you know, 30 minutes <laughs> back in time. To, to, <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, actually. You could just, if you could, but like you redo. Could only go back 30 minutes, but you yeah. get to like redo it. Yeah, it's redo. Think about <laughs> making sure every first impression was perfect. You're like, that did not go well. Boop. <laughs> Hey, yeah. so nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love it. Cool. Uh, last one. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Uh, definitely go to happycampercapital.com. Uh, we have an about us tab there. Click on that. You'll see my profile page there. You can click on that. Read more about me. There's a, 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 a <clears throat> connect with me button at the bottom right. So you can set up a time to talk. Um, that's probably the best way to get hold of me. 
Awesome. Don, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing insight into the uh, RV asset class. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.